A former top 50 prospect in the 2023 class with four years of eligibility is now in the transfer portal. He might be the perfect developmental piece for Mark Few's team. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome in the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. Right now, new customers who join today will get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, St. Mary's lost an associate head coach. San Francisco lost their starting point guard. We also got the latest rumblings about Kentucky's head coaching search all coming up on today's show. We are going to start talking about a player in the transfer portal that had some connection to Gonzaga. Before we get to that, very quickly, want to give a shout out to Derek on Discord at Salog16. He is the winner of the Locked on Zags bracket challenge. Derek's bracket, 99.5 percentile. It's one of the highest I have ever seen. Tremendous, tremendous bracket from Derek. Congratulations on winning the Locked on Zags bracket challenge. We will do this continuously every single year. If you want to join, make sure to join us on our Discord channel. It is free. There's a link in the show notes. You can come hang out with us there then. All right, today we're talking Wesley Yates today. For those of you who uh, were kind of tracking a lot of the recruiting and everything that was going on last offseason, Wesley Yates is probably a name that will ring some bells for you all. Yates has entered the transfer portal out of the University of Washington. Yates is a six foot four shooting guard from Beaumont, Texas. He was 51st in the 2023 recruiting class per on threes composite rankings. He was like between 51st and 54th at on three at 24 seven at ESPN. I think rivals was the highest on him. I think they had him 37th, but regardless, he was pretty generally considered right in that 50 range in the 2023 class for the record. That's pretty much exactly where Dusty Stromer was as well. I think Dusty's composite ranking was just above 50. I'm not actually 100% sure off the top of my head where it was. I think it was like 48th, somewhere in those in there. So basically, Yates and Stromer were considered neck and neck in terms of their rankings in that 2023 class. If the name's not ringing a bell and you're like, well, Gonzaga played Washington, why didn't that name come up? Wesley Yates was unable to play for the entire 23-24 season at University of Washington because of a foot injury, unfortunately. Now, the reason that a kid from Beaumont, Texas, committed to Washington in the first place is because he has family connection to Seattle area, to Washington. His dad grew up in Seattle, and his cousin is Quincy Pondexter, who is a former NBA player, former Washington alum, and at the time was an assistant coach at the University of Washington. So Yates commits to Washington to go play uh, where his cousin is on staff to go play kind of closer to where his, some of his family lives, suffers a foot injury, and he tries to get back in time to come back in the middle of the season, unfortunately suffers a setback to said foot injury and is unable to suit up for the rest of the year. Then, of course, UW goes through a coaching change this offseason. We kind of expected that that was eventually going to have to happen. Mike Hopkins held on to his job as the head coach at UW for a pretty long time, considering the lack of success that that program really ended up having in that era. They move on this offseason. They make a great hire in Danny Sprinkle out of Utah State. Two years ago, Danny Sprinkle was leading Montana State to the NCAA tournament. Last year, Utah State picked to finish ninth as they had to replace their head coach, uh, Ryan Odom. Not only does Utah State not finish ninth in the Mountain West, they win the regular regular season, get an eight seed. Uh, really nice job from Danny Sprinkle. And it's important to acknowledge here that Wesley Yates didn't rule out a return to UW. In his announcement on social media that he was entering the transfer portal, he specifically said he is keeping UW in mind. And I think Generally, you kind of assume when a player enters the transfer portal and they don't say anything like that and they just thank their coaches and they kind of move on, you, you're expecting they're not going to return. And I think even when players do say, well, I'm you know, keeping my eye on potentially returning, you still generally 
expect that they're not going to. But I think it's important to acknowledge, like, Yates, he didn't get a chance to play at UW, uh, and I think there's still some family connections at Washington. I think Danny Sprinkle's a great recruiter and a coach. Like, th there's a possibility that he ends up staying here uh, at Washington. But he's got four years of eligibility left as a medical redshirt, so that's a really appealing kind of aspect of his candidacy in the transfer portal. And like I said, the Zags were one of the schools that were interested in him out of high school. Now, there were a lot of places interested in Wesley Yates out of high school. He got offers from the following program. This is not even a comprehensive list, just some of the schools that made him scholarship offers before he chose to go to Washington. That list includes LSU, Texas, Auburn, Baylor, Houston, Arkansas, Alabama, Xavier, Memphis, Illinois, NC State, Texas A&M, and TCU. At the time prior to committing to Washington, he officially visited LSU, Texas, Auburn and Stanford didn't even mention Stanford in there, but that was one of his official visits. So at this point, he, I'm recording this less than 24 hours after it was revealed that he is entering the transfer portal. There is not a strong indication of who has reached back out to him, whether he has schools in mind, what, what the situation is. We're going off of who recruited him out of high school. Now, a lot of these programs are probably still going to have interest in Wesley Yates, not knowing the exact situation medically with where he's at right now is clearly a factor here. And Gonzaga obviously has familiarity recruiting players who have missed the entire previous season with an injury, something they literally just did with Graham E.K. at Wyoming. Now, Wesley Yates is not Graham E.K. He's not going to have a Graham E.K. type impact at Gonzaga, at least not in his first year, but certainly the severity of his foot injury and, and whether he's going to be 100% coming into the season is going to determine how much attention he gets in the transfer portal. Looking just kind of quickly at the at the programs that he visited last year, Texas has to replace Max Acemas. They're very likely in the market for a guard. Auburn just found out that their star freshman, Aiden Holloway, has entered the transfer portal. Katie Johnson also entered the transfer portal. That's two of their guards from last year's roster. Stanford has a mass exodus of players following the departure of Jared Haas. Kyle Smith, the new head coach there, probably going to show some interest here as well. Uh, so, so, we're looking at a situation where a lot of the same programs are probably going to remain in the mix here. But why Gonzaga really makes sense here. This is the kind of player that I think Gonzaga needs to be trying to target. Because as we've said on this show multiple, multiple times, Gonzaga's rotation for the upcoming season, assuming no very surprise departures, is pretty well set. Ryan Nemhart and Nolan Hickman are going to be your starting guards in the 24-25 season. There's three players who are going to play minutes at the three and, and probably a little bit at the two as well in Michael Ajayi, the transfer from Pepperdine, Steel Venters coming off the missed season with an ACL injury, and Dusty Stromer. And then in the front court, it's not really relevant here, but you have Graham Ike, you have Ben Gregg, you have Braden Huff, who are all going to fill roles as well. You also have Luke Krinovich and Jun Sukyo and Pavle Stosic, who... who you know, are going to be competing for some minutes as well. So the, the roster is pretty full. So you want somebody who's maybe be, going to be more willing to play a smaller role. You don't want somebody who's going to come in and looking for immediate minutes. You know, you're not looking for a, a player who, who wants to transfer to a school and get big minutes and go to the NBA after the year. That's that's Michael Ajayi. You already got that guy in the transfer portal. You don't have room for somebody else. You want somebody who wants to transfer in and learn the system, develop behind the scenes, and, and take on a bigger role the following year. And I think a lot of people think that you just can't find players like that. Every player who enters the transfer portal is looking for immediate playing time. And you know what? Probably a lot of them are. Probably the vast, vast majority of them are. But that does not mean that a program like Gonzaga, which has an incredible track record of success developing talent, cannot find players who are willing to transfer here and develop in time into the system and kind of grow with it. I mean, Gonzaga added multiple transfers last year. All of them are coming back. So it's not like that can't happen. Yes, all of them had a baseline higher than where Wesley Yates is going to be. But that still, I think, proves that you can add players in the transfer portal who are willing to do that. Is Wesley Yates that guy? I have no idea. I don't know. If he's, you know, if Gonzaga calls him and they reach out and they say, hey, you know, Wesley, this is what we got in mind for you. We want you to come in, compete for third guard minutes. You know, you're, you're going to play with Ryan Nempard. You're going to play with Nolan Hickman. We got a role for you. It's maybe not a huge role, but you're going to get some playing time. You're going to learn the system. You're going to be in this vibrant, high octane offense. You're going to be able to, to take over the reins as a key contributor to this team in the following season when Ryan graduates, when Nolan graduates, when Ajayi graduates. Like, you're going to be able to take on a bigger role. And he might say, no, thanks. I'd rather find a spot where I can play right away, in which case, fine. 
you move on. You look for the next guy. But if he's willing to do that, the appeal here is great. He's six foot four. He's a big body guy, high level scorer, likes to get out and run, kind of can play some physical bully ball style as well. Like those, those Texas kids can really are often those, those big strong bodied guards that you see. That's why Houston has a lot of those kind of kids on their team. And I think that he's the, the combination of skills would really be a big benefit at Gonzaga. It's why they were interested in him in the first place when he was coming out of high school. He would compete with Luka Krinovich for third, fourth guard minutes. And like we said, take on a bigger role the following year. I don't know if he's going to be interested in that necessarily, but it's very appealing to be able to recruit him and ask him and, and talk to him and try to see if he wants to do that. If he does, you sell him on, hey, you're going to be in a backcourt next year with Isaiah Harwell. The Zags still need to get that commitment from Isaiah Harwell, certainly. But a, a Harwell, Wesley Yates backcourt as the replacement for Ryan Nempart and Nolan Hickman, huge incredibly good. They'll probably need to get some veteran in there so that they have a little bit of experience, but man, that could be really, really good. And then the question here, I have no idea if Zoom Diallo and Wesley Yates have a relationship, are close, but Zoom Diallo is kind of a, a player we're, we're keeping an eye on right now as a uh, one of the premier prospects in that 2024 class who uh, was committed to Washington, but with Washington having a new coach, we're not sure what's going to happen with Zoom. So if Wesley Yates were to come to Gonzaga, that could be something we keep an eye on of whether Zoom would follow suit. So we'll definitely keep an eye on Wesley Yates. He's an intriguing name to me that I think could be one of the additions Gonzaga could make that would maybe kind of slide under the radar. And then a few years from now, it's like, oh, wow, that really worked out well for Mark Few and the Zags. Well, folks, pandemonium, pandemonium hit social media on Wednesday as folks were trying to figure out whether Scott Drew was in Waco, whether he was in Lexington. Is he leaving Baylor to replace John Calipari at Kentucky? We're going to discuss the latest on that. Coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Game Time. Now that the tournament is over, it is time to go take in some MLB games. Maybe it's a last minute trip for you and a group of friends to go out to Seattle and hit up a game. Great news. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They have last minute deals, which you can save up to 60% buying last minute for not only sports, but comedy, concerts, theater, and more. I often worry about my tickets being not real if you're buying them from third party outlets, but with Game Time's ticket coverage, your purchase is covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. And I love having that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Create an account, redeem code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off. Download the GameTime app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, folks, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zach's podcast. Moving away from talking about Wesley Yates an appealing potential transfer portal target for Mark Few and the Bulldogs, and once again talking about Kentucky basketball. The biggest story in college hoops right now, John Calipari, after 15 years manning the ship for Big Blue Nation and the Kentucky Wildcats, he is out the door, officially announced on Wednesday as the head coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks. It's been in the works for a while, but now it is finalized. He's out. He's no longer at Kentucky. Seeing him on social media in red, wearing Arkansas colors, very jarring, very difficult to get used to. Uh, it's going to be insane to see what happens at Bud Walton Arena or Rupp Arena when Kentucky and Arkansas play each other next year. But the main question is who the heck's going to be on the sideline in Lexington? Who's going to be that head man? Uh, the Kentucky job doesn't come open all that often. And when it does, it is the biggest, most appealing job in college basketball for good reason. But right now, and I'm going to timestamp this. I don't typically do this, but it is 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, April 10th, when I'm recording this right now as I'm speaking to you. That is where we are with the latest information because this thing is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. The most recent thing was indications from Kentucky reporters that they don't think anything will be finalized tonight. So by the time you're listening to this, it is unlikely that there has been a final decision made for the Kentucky Wildcats. That could change, of course, and when it does, we will continue to get you updated on everything going on with this Kentucky job because it has direct ramifications on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. 
But right now, there's nothing finalized. The reports are three different coaches. UConn's Danny Hurley, Baylor's Scott Drew, Billy Donovan, the head coach of the Chicago Bulls. The latest is that Billy Donovan is still coaching the Chicago Bulls. They are in the play-in tournament. Uh, he's going to be coaching them for the next two weeks. He doesn't seem incredibly interested in the job from the quotes that he has said. He hasn't coached in college basketball since 2015. That seems like the least likely to me right now. Danny Hurley has been offered, reportedly, huge amounts of money from Kentucky. Huge, like $10, $11 million a year which is an insane amount of money for a college basketball coach. But Danny Hurley has indicated as directly as I think he's going to, I'm not focused on taking another job. I am planning to, you know, my focus right now is a three-peat. My focus is winning another championship at UConn. He seems happy there. He doesn't seem like he's planning to go anywhere. Obviously, Kentucky seems to be continually willing to throw a huge amount of money at him. And why wouldn't you? He just led UConn to back-to-back -back national championships. Like, I, I, I get it. I get why Kentucky's super invested, but... The general read from Kentucky reporters and analysts and fans and everybody is that Danny Hurley's not going anywhere, that he's staying at UConn. Billy Donovan doesn't seem like a super likely candidate. Danny Hurley doesn't seem like a super likely candidate. But folks, Scott Drew might be. His run at Baylor, 20 years at Baylor, taking them to a national championship, turning them from a program of complete irrelevance into one of the best basketball programs in the best basketball conference in the world, it might be coming to an end truly might be the end of the road for Scott Drew at Baylor. And if it is, tremendous career that he has had at Baylor will be fascinating to see what direction Baylor goes from there, whether they hire Jerome Tang at Kansas State or Grant McCasland at Texas Tech, two teams that are in the Big 12 alongside Baylor, but those two coaches both used to work at Baylor under Scott Drew. Very interested to see what happens there if this comes together. Obviously, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves right now thinking about that, but the day on Wednesday was crazy. Scott Drew posted a picture of him at having lunch at a Mexican restaurant in Waco with a friend, a supporter of the program. People went crazy analyzing whether the picture was current, whether the picture was old, whether the, like whether he was gaslighting people effectively into believing that he was currently in Waco when in reality he was in Lexington. Dick Vitale's uh, posting on Twitter that he heard that Scott Drew's in Lexington. There are people looking at the background of the Mexican restaurant and seeing that Family Feud is on TV and trying to determine whether that specific episode of Family Feud was actually airing that day. I'm not kidding. This is what was happening on social media. People were going crazy trying to figure out if Scott Drew was actually in Waco or if he had gone down to Lexington. That is how insane Kentucky basketball coaching searches are. And again, as I'm recording right now, no update. The things we've heard, and again, we've heard varying reports from different sources. It's hard to know what's real, what is, what are people reporting what they think is real, but that it's changing. Like everything is always up in the air with these kinds of situations. But the general consensus that we're seeing is that there is mutual interest between Drew and Kentucky. Drew is torn on whether he wants to actually leave Baylor and go to Kentucky or not. Some people think that there's a financial negotiation is, is the main hiccup right now. Uh, some people think that Kentucky is not fully going in on Drew until they get an absolute definitive no from Danny Hurley. Like there's a lot of different factors right now that are kind of playing into that. So what does this mean for Gonzaga? The first immediate thing that this kind of relates to Gonzaga is the four games remaining in this home and home series that John Calipari and Mark Few agreed to two years ago. Gonzaga has played two of these games with Kentucky so far. They're also 2-0 in those games. They won at the Spokane Arena the previous season, 22-23. And then this year, of course, went to Rupp Arena, picked up a huge home victory, their first quad one game, carried that momentum into a couple more quad one wins, a five seed in the NCAA tournament, and a return to the Sweet 16. So Mark Few and Gonzaga, they got to thank Kentucky. Like that was a that game catapulted them to where they ended up finishing the season. It was critical for them, for their resume, to have this game. I don't think it can be understated that having four more years, knowing that one of Gonzaga's non-conference games will be against Kentucky, that is significant. Even with Kentucky in more flux right now than usual because they don't have a head coach. They're not going to land on somebody bad. Like the, the, the lowest options that they're kind of 
that are kind of being rumored for them right now include like Mark Pope at BYU, Sean Miller at Xavier. I've heard Tommy Lloyd's name floated, although I don't think that that's very likely to happen. Buzz Williams at Texas A&M, even Bruce Pearl at Auburn has been out there. But to me, it sounds like it's going to be Scott Drew. Maybe they can pull something with Billy Donovan. If it's not them, I think maybe you, you look to Sean Miller at Xavier feels like the next kind of likely candidate. But for Gonzaga, the question is whether this series will continue. I don't see why a Kentucky coach would cancel this. Let's put it this way. Scott Drew, very unlikely to cancel it. I think if Scott Drew takes over, he's he's all in on this because Scott Drew and Mark Few are friends. They've played each other before. They've played each other in secret scrimmages. They've played each other publicly in, in regular season games. Like I don't see why Scott Drew taking over at Kentucky would prevent this series from happening. Frankly, I feel the same if it was Danny Hurley. I have no idea about Billy Donovan. It seems odd that a coach would come in uh, and um, just cancel the series. I don't. That doesn't really make sense to me why you would do that unless you're adamant you think you can get better than four years of playing Gonzaga, which you can't really. Like it's a pretty darn good gig to have that on the schedule. So that's the main thing I'm very curious about in this Kentucky coaching search. Uh, it's also worth wondering if there's the potential that Gonzaga and Arkansas could schedule some kind of series. John Calipari and Mark Few, they're, again, they're friends. They played each other in the regular season uh, during like conference play back when Calipari was at Memphis. They played each other in February this year when Calipari was at Kentucky. Could they schedule something similar once again when with Calipari at Arkansas? I'm not necessarily thinking it'll happen right away, but if Cal's there for four or five years, I could see Mark Few and John Calipari once again finding a way to connect, whether it's just a quick two-year home and home, whether it's just one game, who knows what might happen there. But uh, that's something to keep an eye on. I think we could end up seeing Gonzaga playing Kentucky and Arkansas in the not-too-distant future. Well, folks, St. Mary's lost their associate head coach. He heads out to Michigan to be on staff with Dusty May. San Francisco lost point guard Mike Share of Jumps to the transfer portal. We're going to get into all of that. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, the sports calendar is loaded right now, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Because right now, customers, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 you can use to bet on the MLB season, NBA, NHL playoffs, and so much more. Right now, folks, Julian Strother and the Denver Nuggets, plus 350 odds to repeat as NBA champions. They've scuffled a bit lately, but I'm not betting against Nikola Jokic and that Nuggets team in the NBA playoffs. If you're with me, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big W. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. All right, folks, closing out the show with a couple WCC updates here in the transfer portal and on the coaching carousel. We'll start with St. Mary's. Their associate head coach, Justin Joyner, has departed the program. He has taken an assistant head coaching job at Michigan under coach Dusty May. Of course, Dusty needed to, to clean house and, and, you know, replacing Juwan Howard at Michigan after a really, I mean, it's the worst season in Michigan basketball since I think the sixties record wise. So they had a big old cleaning house to do. May goes over there, takes some of his guys from Florida Atlantic, but needed some other guys and, and finds Justin Joyner. This is a really great hire for Dusty May. It's a really great hire for Michigan. It's also a really big loss for Randy Bennett and the Gales. Joyner's been at St. Mary's since 2017. He was promoted to associate head coach in 2022, so he's had this job for a couple of years now, and he is directly responsible for many of their biggest recruits, including Aiden Mahaney. Justin Joyner is who landed Aiden Mahaney, one of their top-ranked recruits that they've ever had, and a player who immediately stepped in and was incredibly valuable, mostly as a freshman. He did took a bit of a dip last year as a sophomore, but still very impactful player in Moraga. Uh, he's also responsible for one of their incoming freshmen, Mikey Lewis, another really highly regarded player that is joining the Gales in Moraga this year. And he's kind of had his hands on a lot of the other recruits that, that St. Mary's has landed recently. One of the best recruiters that we have seen at St. Mary's. This is why it's a nice hire for Dusty May. If you can recruit at St. Mary's, you can recruit probably really well at Michigan. So that's going to be a big jump for them. But the question becomes, what does this mean for St. Mary's? Could there be more departures? My instinct says probably not. Michigan and St. Mary's don't typically recruit the same types of guys, so I don't think there's going to be a lot of a lot of the players who are at St. Mary's, including Mahaney, are, are local to the Bay Area. I don't think those guys are going to jump ship to Ann Arbor because their assistant coach left. It just doesn't strike me as that likely. Not impossible. Maybe more so likely with some of the incoming guys who haven't actually played at St. Mary's yet. Maybe they decommit and follow Joyner to Michigan. But again, Michigan's going to need to want those guys. Like they may they may not be on the radar for for Dusty May in Michigan. So not something I'm super 
expecting to see. Joshua Jefferson is obviously already in the transfer portal. He is not connected to Michigan currently. In fact, he has four schools that he's been connected to. That's Virginia. Maybe he wants to go play for the other Defensive-minded coach named Bennett, uh, VCU, UNLV, he's from Las Vegas, and then Iowa State, which frankly would be a really nice fit for Justin Jefferson if he were to end up there. Um, Mahaney obviously would be the huge loss. I would be very surprised. Like, Mahaney's good enough to play at Michigan, but I don't see him leaving his hometown. He, like, played high school basketball five minutes from Moraga. I'd be very surprised to see him leave St. Mary's to go to Michigan to follow an assistant coach. This feels pretty unlikely to me. Now, Mike Sheriff Johns, the other big story here in the WCC, he's out the door at San Francisco, or at least I should say he has entered the transfer portal. And Sheriff Johns, just he never really found his footing at San Francisco. He, he played 34 games for them. He started all of them. He played about 25 minutes a game. His numbers were fine, a little under eight points, about three boards, two and a half assists, about a steal per game, shot 36% from three on three and a half attempts a game, shot 49% on two pointers, but he just wasn't very aggressive offensively, didn't really hunt his shot. Uh, I spoke to coach Chris Gerlifson from San Francisco a couple times on Locked On Zags and Locked On College Basketball this last year, and that was kind of one thing he talked about was like trying to get Mike to be you know more aggressive to going downhill and, and trying to look for his own shot and, and hunt for it a little bit more, and he just never really did and ended up kind of letting guys like Malik Thomas and Marcus Williams sort of take over more offensively than he did. Did. Obviously, Jonathan Mobo was a big part of what that team did, but it just never felt like he was quite comfortable in that setting. And Sheriff Johns began his career at Dayton. He was a top 100 pros prospect, went to Dayton, didn't put up huge numbers there, entered the portal, comes to San Francisco. Now two years in a row where we just haven't seen him quite really reach the potential that you can see watching him. He's six foot six, six foot seven point guard. He's a fluid athlete. He's a good shooter. Like you can see why he's such a tantalizing prospect. But in two years of college basketball now, he just hasn't quite found that footing. I'm very curious what happens for him. Reportedly, he put a do not contact on his tag in the transfer portal, which means that he doesn't want teams to contact him, but it also likely means that that means he has an idea of where he wants to go. And so this could end up kind of ending quickly for him where he finds a new, a new landing spot. For San Francisco, they have young guards who are going to step up, take on bigger roles. I'm sure Chris Groveson will find somebody in the transfer portal. He's been very good at navigating the portal up to this point. So I, I don't think this is a huge loss for the Dons in terms of their talent level next year, uh, but it's disappointing that Sheriff Jumps just – never really found what I think could have made him great at San Francisco. Last thing I want to talk about here, Portland added a transfer from Elon, Max McKinnon. This is the second transfer portal edition for the WCC as an entire conference. And I'm not counting Oregon State and Washington State. I know they've made portal additions, but of the schools who were in the WCC this past year, there's only been two players who have officially confirmed transferred in. And that's, of course, Michael Ajayi at Gonzaga and now Max McKinnon at Portland. And Max McKinnon is a six foot five big guard from Australia, very similar to Tyler Robertson, who finished his historic career at Portland. He was one of the most prolific players in Pilots history. Uh, he was also a six foot five Australian guard. So clearly there's a type there for Shantae Leggins. We always talk about St. Mary's being the pipeline for Australians, but there have been quite a few of them at the University of Portland as well. And McKinnon has a chance to step in and be a really impact player right away for the Pilots. He spent two years at Elon, and in his, in his most recent season as a sophomore, he averaged 12 points, five boards, two and a half assists in 32 games, played 27 minutes, 36% three-point shooter on four and a half attempts per game, a little over 51% on twos. This is a really good player guy who's done it at the D1 level already for two years. He was a double-digit scorer as a true freshman. Now he comes into a team that's really decimated. Robertson left. They also had seven players leave in the transfer portal, including Juanse Gorosito, who played a big role for them last year. Uh, I'm curious what Shantae's team is going to look like, but I can tell you right now, don't be surprised if Max McKinnon is their leading scorer or one of their best players next year. I think this is a sneaky, great addition for Shantae Leggins and the Pilots. It's going to wrap it up for us today. we got one more show this week on Friday. The plan right now is to do the second of our season in review series. Uh, certainly if any portal updates happen or Kentucky coaching job updates happen, we might be able to get to that as well uh, coming your way on Friday. Thanks to all of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. And until Friday, as always, go Zags.